Hey everybody, it's Camden back with Generation Z Podcast. The following conversation is with Jameson Crawford. He is from Stewards of Revolution on YouTube. He is new to the YouTube game, but he is incredibly well informed. He has degrees in anthropology and biology. He really does know his stuff. From the get-go, we jump into Epstein, Kevin Spacey, Prince Andrew, the entire complex that is the British Royals. We touched on Diana, the obvious conspiracies there. We also really dug deep on the politicians and their connections in the mainstream media. I'm talking Cuomo brothers, the Bushes, W's daughter being an anchor, Cindy McCain, Meghan McCain. There's just so much of it to talk about. We also really did focus a lot because of his degrees on the anthropology. He knows his stuff and a lot of human history. Uh, of course, human history and technology and its connections to humanity led us into big tech today. And at that point, I felt it was best to cut it off. That is two thirds of the way through the interview. After that point, we talk about big tech, emergence theory, the great filter, transhumanism. But honestly, it didn't feel smart to speak out so negatively against the platform that you're posting on. I really don't like it, but they are shadow banning us. They are removing likes. They are doing anything they can, and they are waiting for us to slip up. So that being said, the entire interview is on Patreon, along with so much other good stuff, hot takes, hard evidence, stuff you really do want to see. And I love your views. I love the likes. I love the, view, uh, the subscriptions. But honestly, in today's age, it is more important than ever to directly support the content creators that you want to stick around. And we don't do ads. I, I hate ads. I hate YouTube channels with ads all in the, over the videos. And it's not us. It's not our style. We don't do that to you guys. So that being said, I really do think you guys will enjoy this hour. This is a fun conversation. And let us know what you think in the comments. All right. So without further ado, we have a very special guest today, Jameson Crawford. I said Jameson, right? Jameson, yes. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Uh, he is known as Stewards of Revolution on YouTube. Um, I came across him through a friend. This is just for the audience to get an idea. And I really liked his work. Uh, he has a, uh, a degree in anthropology in addition to biology. But not only that, his ties to Epstein in addition to many of the, I guess you could say, investigative reporting and connections he's done, I really do believe deserves to be uh, put out there more, uh, if you will. So without further ado, uh, James and Sir, thank you so much for coming on. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate the exposure and the platform. No, no Thanks problem. What's no problem whatsoever. So let's uh, let's dive right into it. Um, okay, so Jeffrey Epstein and the ABC News uh, cover up. If uh, did you want to jump right into that and explain to everyone in 2016 what uh, yeah. what happened there? Yeah, let's get right into that. So a lot of people are aware of the Amy Robach leak that happened uh, that came out in 2019, where ABC News anchor Amy Robach was caught on a hot mic. And basically, she was explaining how she had an interview with Epstein accuser Virginia Roberts Dufre, and uh, ABC quashed the story. And this is yeah, this was back in 2015, 2016 time. And basically, sorry, give me a second. I'm just looking at my notes real quick. No problem, no problem. Just trying to think, figure out where exactly to start with this. So I guess I'll start with what. So after seeing that footage of Amy Robach, it's kind of what motivated me to just start looking through ABC's coverage of the royal family, because in right. that leak, she mentioned specifically that, um, that the royal family had called ABC and threatened them when they heard that they were going to air an interview with the Epstein victim, because she uh, had directly uh, accused Prince Andrew. Right. And uh, Amy Robach specified... Uh, well, she said they threatened her a million different ways, but one of the ways that she specified was that they had uh, threatened to withhold access to uh, Kate and Will, uh, Prince William and uh, his wife, Kate. And so I decided to start looking at just how they covered the royals family in general, since they clearly uh, were on, you know, the royals had the power in that dynamic and right. they were uh, threatening to withhold access. And in American media, obviously it's profit motivated. And so access means profit. And so if they can withhold the access, they can, uh, you know, give them, they can use the profit motive against them. So, uh, sorry, go on. 
Yeah, and so I just wanted to look at how they covered the Roars more broadly. And so I just started looking at all the coverage of the Raw family done by ABC News and noticed a few eerie patterns. Um, what, I think one of the most eerie things that I uncovered was they really kept pushing this narrative that the Royal family is just like us. They used that phrase, just like us, at least half a dozen times that I could find. And it, it, was, it just was a, such a clear attempt of them trying to humanize the, the Royal family, this like, you know, this evil power structure. And they're just trying to make them seem, yeah, just like us. And so I found that really creepy. Uh, in sorry, your, you... sorry, in your opinion, what um, I, I presume you've seen the Prince Andrew interview, correct? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So why do you think he did that? Because that was, uh, I mean, everyone and, and their mother could see it was a car crash and a half, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, I've heard that uh, his daughter, Eugenie, had a big role in that. Um, yeah, uh, I forget where exactly I heard that, but I believe that's been confirmed. Uh, his, his daughter Eugenie was deeply embarrassed by everything and she maybe she actually thought he was innocent being her, his daughter and looking up to her father and maybe she was just thinking get out in front of this give the interview uh, maybe having the naivety of thinking he was innocent and right. uh, it, it was such a bizarre interview and I'm so I'm so glad it happened but it, <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> It really is. Um, yeah. I, I also just think it comes down to arrogance. Uh, that, that he's better than everyone, even if he is guilty. It's kind of just like he's saying F you to the world, so to speak. Yeah, well, I think he's probably just spent his whole life surrounded by essentially yes men, right? People who right. hang on every word he says. And he's, you know, in his life, if he's ever had to lie and manipulate people, it, he probably, even if he's not very good at it, he probably gets away with it. And he, he, that might make him think he is good at lying and manipulating, which he clearly isn't because the lies he was telling were so outlandish. Right. He, he was saying... Um, he couldn't sweat. He couldn't sweat. <laughs> he, all, he all, could, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, he couldn't be at the nightclub because he was at his daughter's birthday party earlier yeah, that evening. That stuff is, uh, is, is quite ridiculous. I, I did want to ask, though, um, with regards to the, the web of Epstein and, and the connections, there's some people that say that, you know, he was only a small cog in a massive operation. Is there any research you've done in your own work um, that you found to be like something that a lot of people don't know, something where it's like, holy shit, like this is, this is something that should be mentioned and it doesn't get mentioned at all? So you're, you're asking if I think there's like someone bigger than Epstein? The, in uh, the operation or someone bigger than Epstein if there are, and if there are any connections even to people below Epstein that you found in your own personal research that the, the media doesn't report well sort of like I, Les I, I Wexner or yeah those yeah guys. I mean Les Wexner is how Epstein kind of got his beginnings money wise right he's the one that gave Epstein that big loan um I don't know if this is quite the answer you're looking for but I have been looking into Kevin Spacey and his involvement and I don't know if that's super well known. Yeah, no, please, please, by all means, if you can expand on that, because I don't think a lot of people know about uh, Spacey and his involvement. I mean, people know that he's been on Epstein's jet and he knew Epstein, but mm -hmm. in terms of his actual direct involvement, I think you did an episode where you analyzed some of the uh, Kevin Spacey's behaviors in that video he put out two, two Christmases mm -hmm. ago, if I'm not mistaken. When yes. he said, when he said uh, after he took a long hiatus from acting, after those allegations came out, and then he did that weird where he, um, that method acting video where he played uh, Frank Underwood from House of Cards. Mm -hmm. it, could you, yeah. could you explain what, what you noticed in that episode uh, of yours there? Yeah. Yeah. So let me be Frank is the name of that, uh, that piece he did. Yeah. And I'm just, I'm just as thankful that exists as I am the Prince Andrew interview because it's just a, it's so eerie and I think it reveals a lot and I think it intended to, I think he intended for it to reveal a lot, um, so when I analyzed Let Me Be Frank, I broke it down into three different layers. Uh, I think on the surface, he was by, and again, the, the title Let Me Be Frank, I think has three meanings, just like he had three meanings throughout the entire piece. Uh, and yeah, in that first layer of meaning, I think Let Me Be Frank basically meant uh, he was about to assume the role of Frank Underwood, which he did. He was right. speaking in Frank Underwood's voice and everything. Right. And I, I think he was speaking to the House of Cards fans and he was speaking as Frank Underwood, and the message was basically that uh, 
you loved this character, even though he was morally reprehensible, which I think is kind of a dog shit uh, point to try and make. Because obviously when it's fiction, we're allowed to root for someone or like have a uh, mixed feelings about a reprehensible right. character because it is fiction and we're right. allowed to be engaged in the storytelling. Um, but that's and, the, that's the, that's the first layer, right? That's the first layer and probably right. the least and the least important probably. And then on the next layer, he was by, let me be Frank. He was, I think literally saying like asking, let me be Frank, like, please let me continue to be Frank. Right. Um, and I think he was speaking as Kevin Spacey, the actor, and he was speaking to kind of society at large. And his overall point was that society canceled him too quickly. It was too reactionary and society's too reactionary in these days in the Me Too era. Um, right. And then the third layer and the most important layer is that uh, I think by let me be frank, he meant it in the most literal sense of I will now be honest and upfront and blatant, uh, blunt. And I think on that layer, he was speaking not as Kevin Spacey, the actor, but as Kevin Spacey, the elite, and he right. was speaking to the powers that be, the powers that be, and he was basically saying, "If I go down, I'm taking you with me." That's and, cool. Yeah, and if you if you watch Let Me Be Frank with all three of those layers in mind, you can see that almost everything he says can work for each of those layers. Can I? So can I sorry, it, brother. Uh, please go on. Please. I was just gonna say, like, at the end of the day, as ominous as it is, as like reprehensible Spacey seems to be. It is undeniably a fantastic piece of art, like and like the the wordplay and the it, it's it's really well done. Oh, ab absolutely! I did want to ask before we get to uh, Camden, uh, brother. I just wanted to ask Jameson what it seems like you have, and correct me if I'm wrong, a very methodical way of analyzing things. It, just in the, just what you explain right now, the three different layers of how you broke that down there. I personally would have never thought of that. Can I ask how that came to be? Was it your your um <clears throat> your perspective towards when you uh, you know were studying anthropology or biology? What what made you look at that as a multi pronged or multi layer message? Um, I think when I first watched it and then watched it again and watched it a few times just because I was so like drawn into it. Right. Um, it seemed to just kind of come to me that there were different layers going on, and I just figured that if I was going to make a video on this. It, because it's a, it's it, at the end of the day, it's a subjective analysis, and right. you know you don't want it to seem you want it to seem as unspeculative as possible. You want it to you want it to feel grounded. You want it to feel like it's not just conspiratorial bullshit. Right. Um, and so I just figured the best way to make it sound grounded and logical was to yeah break it down methodically. And yeah, maybe I just have an analytical mind and. That just kind of I think it felt, it felt like the best way to go about it if I want to what if I wanted to feel compelling and maybe have some merit. Awesome, awesome. Uh, Camden, brother, you want to jump in? Well, I was. I mean, it's nice that you brought up Kevin Spacey and his kind of like "let me be me" thing because like he's got a movie coming out maybe next year. I don't know if you know about it, but where he literally yeah, I just heard about someone, this. Where he plays someone that literally does go hunt down pedophiles and things. And you've mm -hmm. got like uh, movies like, I mean, the community at large kind of, you know, has its opinions about uh, Tom Hanks. And he plays these movies where he's like Mr. Rogers, where he's like uh, the guy that's giving, you know, the message to the world and the Pony Express thing. And like, why do these people then make sure that they're playing wholly ide idealistic like characters in their screen time for their to like kind of like to what to like back up their acts behind the scenes or, you know? I mean, I was I wouldn't say that Kevin Spacey tends to take roles of holistic no, he, you're uh, right. no, he whole, doesn't. characters. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Tom Hanks does, and I I don't really know how Tom Hanks plays into everything. I I know there are some eerie things about him. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the one concrete thing I can say about Hanks that I didn't like was uh, he once did this weird skit on I believe it was. Jimmy Kim. No, Jimmy, Kim, David Jimmy Pumpkins. Oh, because that one's no, weird. no, it wasn't that one. I know what you're talking okay, about. That yeah. one, that, that one's just weird. But yeah. On, on, um, yeah, I think it was Jimmy Kimmel. Uh, he did this bit where, uh, they were making fun of child beauty pageants, essentially. Oh, and gosh. it's like, and it's like fair play, like, we uh -huh. like those things are horrible, right? Uh, and so he, he had a child actress in the skit with him, and in the skit they were like sexualizing her and i uh. I, I i get like 
making fun of of that right. that realm but to make fun of it they were replicating what's so bad about it what's so bad like that, about that, it, that, right. that was a, that was an actual child actress that they were sexualizing right. in the bits right. and i found i found that a bit off-putting and i'm definitely not one to clutch my pearls at like edgy jokes and like touching sure, those kind of topics sure, sure, sure. especially right. if you're just like alone on a stage doing stand-up something like that but like when there's actually a child actress involved i found that a bit off-putting um I, well, speaking of which, uh, sorry, Camden. Uh, you... Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. I, I wanted to ask about uh, Cindy McCain. Um, oh, yeah. It's, I, I wanted to get your perspective on Cindy McCain. You can start wherever you like with regards to, I think she said something along the lines of, uh, we all knew about Epstein. We all knew what he was doing. And yeah. you, had me you had mentioned to me earlier that you uh, dug into her past and you found some wild stuff. Is there any, anything you could touch on there that maybe yeah. the pub generally the public wouldn't know? No, definitely. Yeah. So I'm going to be releasing that video on her probably tomorrow, Wednesday, recording this on Tuesday. I'm not sure when you plan on posting this, mm -hmm. but uh, I plan on posting this video tomorrow on Sydney McCain because, is yes. There, sorry, is there any way you could, we, we plan to post this either tonight or tomorrow. Is there any way you could give us a bit of a preview of what's to come in your episode, if that's cool? Definitely, definitely. Yeah. So um, basically, yeah, when I saw that footage of her saying that about Epstein, basically saying the quiet part out loud, saying we all knew about him, we all knew what he was doing. Right. And and she said that when she was like on a panel about sex trafficking. And so, whoa, it, yeah, that's where she said it. So it made me think, like, is she some kind of authority on sex trafficking? Like, why is she talking about this? So I looked into it. Yeah, yeah she's she's done a lot of work in that kind of field of uh, philanthropy, I guess you could say, of, of or raising awareness against sex trafficking and stuff. And she has this bizarre story that she likes to tell. I don't know why she shares this, but she has a story. <laughs> it's, it's, it's ridiculous. She has a story about one time she was in India and she was shopping for her daughter and she was in some shop in India and she looks down and she sees all these eyes underneath the floorboards. And what? it's ridiculous. And then she tells this story because she says, she says, Oh, and, okay, so I found her saying this a couple different times, and she's never consistent with the amount of eyes. It ranges from thirty to a hundred sets of eyes. Wow! And, Sorry, every you're saying every time she tells the story, story. it's a different. Yeah. She it's a different set of eyes. It's a different amount. Okay. Yeah, a different amount. It, which okay. is which is kind of weird. Like, get your numbers straight, lady. But <laughs> uh, she says that she walked out at the store and didn't do anything she flew home and decided to educate herself on the topic what mm. as if like she did she did nothing she did and and uh i, I wanted to try and uh, locate when in time this trip to india was and yeah. in what in one interview in 2013 she said it happened 10 years ago so it happened around 2003 right so she wasn't some 18 year old tourist with no power Right. No means to right. help. Right. She was she was already the wife of a prominent senator. Uh, she she most likely had a security detail, and she definitely had access to embassies and diplomats. But oh, she just, doesn't uh, make sense. Like the inaction there, like the complete uh, inaction. And it's like it's the same thing with Epstein. We all knew about him. We just you know, we just we didn't knew what do he was anything. doing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And yet she's some authority on combating sex trafficking. Well, <laughs> or she's authority on keeping it going it more sounds like i guess <laughs> quite quite uh, definitely quite ironic uh, i wanted to if it's cool transition into the um the relation between the media and politicians i know that you had said uh before this uh, this conversation that you wanted to uh, hunker down on some on some core foundational points that people generally don't know about if they just watch mainstream media and things like that is there any form of reporting, connections, anything on your end that you can talk about with regards to the, uh, as you put it, the incestuous relationship between the, the, the politicians and the media? Yeah, so I'm currently in the early stages of working on a three-part video series on the incestuous relationship between the politicians and the media. Very cool. Uh, the, the first part's going to be on the Cuomo brothers. Of course, Andrew Cuomo is the governor of New York, and Chris Cuomo is... Uh, the CNN anchor, right? And I think I think a lot of people, especially in this last year, have become more aware of how problematic that has been. 
Um, well, I mean, sorry, just to say very quickly, not only the Cuomo brothers, but even other politicians, um, uh, there's been, uh, you know, uh, censorship, uh, what they would call uh, political blackouts, like, you know, uh, in 2016, uh, Bernie had the allegedly the uh, primary stolen from him by Hillary, it was mm-hmm. somewhat admitted kind of, and then they everyone just kind of, you know, let it go and moved on, so to speak. Um, but yeah, please, please go on. Yeah, so uh yeah, it's definitely not just the Cuomo brothers. It's it's an entire incestuous relationship. Uh and and a lot of the times it's not literally incestuous with brothers, but uh, right. it, but these two classes of the politicians and the and the media figures, they're all hanging out together, they're all at the same functions, mm. they're all getting to know each other on a personal level. Right. And and so once there's a personal relationship there, even if it's not family the media is going to be less uh media figures are going to be less inclined to be straight up combative with right. these politicians because because it's just simply more awkward because these are people you see around and socialize yeah. with uh, right. yeah is and there so- anything sorry is there anything about andrew como or chris como that you found in your research that you'd be able to give us a bit of a preview um on yeah i did find something uh so back in 2013, I, f- I found a video where there was a uh, Chris Cuomo was getting a bit of backlash for interviewing Andrew, and this was yeah back in 2013, and uh, 2000 sorry 2013 yeah yeah okay, a- okay. and there was uh, there was uh, some Twitter users who were uh, criticizing Chris for interviewing his brother, and they were basically saying oh can we get someone not named Cuomo to interview Andrew Cuomo, things like that. And, right. and Chris responded to it. And he was basically like, look, I won't, I'm not going to interview my brother on anything relating to his politics or his campaign, but I can, re- I can, uh, I can interview him on other subjects. And he, and, but the thing about the media is it's not always this. It's not always the subjects they cover. It's the subjects they don't cover. Right. Yeah. So, so, He's been interviewing his brother all throughout 2020 during the COVID crisis. He was going on Chris's uh, CNN show every night, and they were goofing off, uh, joking around, playing with big old Q-tips. I don't know if you know that segment. Yeah, I saw. Yeah, the, the Q-tip segment. Yeah, where they're laughing and everything. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, that was sorry. I just want to say quickly when people said, you know, uh, about a year ago when they were doing the Q-tips and they were laughing, and then CNN uh, banned Chris Cuomo from interviewing his brother because of mm-hmm. these sexual allegations. People are saying, again, the hypocrisy is is clearly there. Now, yeah. again, the legitimate concern, well, legitimate with air quotes, is that, you know, it's a conflict of interest because they're brothers. And my answer to that is, okay, then a part of my English here, but fucking get Don Lemon to interview him then. Exactly. You know what I mean? Get, yeah. get Don so, Lemon to ask those questions. But yeah, please go on. Uh, Jake Tapper, the other, he's another yep. CNN guy. Yep. Uh, he's been pretty uh, blunt about... Uh, Chris and Andrew Cuomo and uh, Jake Tapper was saying he kept trying to get Chris to go on his show uh, throughout the pandemic, but nope. Uh, Andrew was just going on Chris's show. Uh, uh, see, because like you said too, it's um when you, it's not always what's there. It's what isn't there. The, exactly. Um, yeah, the best example I like to give is, um, you know, have you seen the, uh, the series? I, for, um, I forgot what it's called. The Unabomber, I think Ted Kaczynski on Netflix. Um, I haven't. I've always wanted to look more into it's, him. Though. There, there's, there's a certain scene in, in the series where uh, they're drawing the FBI is drawing on a whiteboard and you could see and they, they shifted their perspective, which was that they created a visual of like a Venn diagram of the things they knew about Mr. Kaczynski. But then they said, hold on, what if we take a step back and look at the things we don't know about him? Because that might be a way to actually find out what's really going on. Gotcha. Right? Yeah. And Interesting. I think that that's a great way. That's a great segue to what you put there. Um, anything else you wanted to, to add to that? Um, if, if not, I just, not, I wanted to, not, not on the Coma brothers, but I could talk about a couple other please, uh, quite, please, relationships. Yes. Uh, so yeah, cause that's only going to be the first part of the series is the Cuomo's. I'm also going to do one on, uh, George W. Bush and his daughter, Jenna Bush. Um, oh, that so, sounds interesting. Yeah, because I feel like not a lot of people was as aware that she is uh yeah, she has a role on the Today Show on NBC. Uh I think a lot of people know about like uh, Megan McCain and her role on The View. Megan McCain people know about, you know, Billy Bush. Um, yeah, yeah. 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 But yeah, uh, Jenna Bush is on MSNBC or yeah, yeah, NBC uh on the Today Show and 
I, I did find this funny moment. Um, it was back in, I want to say 2009. Yeah, yeah, because it was uh, after Bush's presidency, just after it, and he was getting his uh, presidential library uh, right. unveiled. And he was giving his speech there. And he was like, uh, remember to tune into my daughter's show on NBC uh, tomorrow morning. I think she had just started. Right. And, and he made a joke and he was like, she started on NBC con continuing further the Bush family's cozy relationship with the media. And he says it kind of sarcastically and everyone laughs because I think, you know, the media was pretty harsh on Bush uh, during his presidency for good reason. But it's just kind of funny in hindsight because he has been so re rehabilitated in recent years, oh, Spe speci specifically because of Trump's election and you know, well, with, he, with he said on CNN a couple months ago or just under, he said something along the lines of, oh, it's scary. No, sorry. I think he said this on. No, he was on Stephen Colbert. For, uh, my apologies. He said, it scares me how easy it is. People can spread mistruths out there. It's like, mm -hmm. are, are you really want to talk? You right. Know, Iraq WMD. Are you really one to talk? You exactly. know, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And it's just so funny because, yeah, the crowd just erupts laughing uh right <laughs> over over how uh, like that would never happen the media would never cozy up to bush and it, it's just funny in hindsight now he's it's, it's now he's dancing with, dancing with ellen and right Exa exactly 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 but uh, please um what, what was your next um your next person that you were going to cover yeah i'll also say this real quickly on on the george bush, bush oh, please, stuff. please um so he recently did an interview with uh this media figure named hoda how do you pronounce her last name? Her last, last name is spelled K-O-B-T, Hoda Kobti. You might recognize her. She's a recognizable face. And she was Jenna Bush's co-host for years on their show. Oh, really? And, and she was the one that interviewed Bush uh, recently, just a few months ago, and, you know, gave a fawning interview to him. And I think it's just a good example of just by dropping Jenna into the media, it creates this ripple effect where she then has personal relationships with all of her co-hosts and people around her. So then they're going to be less inclined to give a hard hitting interview to her father. Right. Right. Like that's so, yeah. So you don't just plant her in the media so that when she talks to George Bush, there's that cozy relationship. There's a ripple effect of you plant her in the media and then everyone around her is going to be less likely to start grilling her dad because that's going to affect their personal relationship. Because it's bringing the human level of things into a system that is supposed to be in pure theory, you know, mm -hmm. per perfect, if you will, in, again, in, in textbook theory. But when you bring in that human level and that human emotion and interaction, it's sort of like what they say about, um, I guess, about, uh, you know, the, the WHO or the United Nations. They get, you know, intelligence spies in there. And when they, you know, after the official meeting is done, they then get, you know, China, Russia, US, uh, they all get their spies to, you know, pull, out, pull a certain ambassador aside and say, listen, you know, there's going to be a million in cash in a bank account in Cyprus or something if you do, if you do this. But again, totally off the books, right? Is that, are mm -hmm. you trying to equate it? Are you uh, equating it to that, bringing that human level in there when it's not supposed to be there? Sort of yeah, thing? definitely. Right. And, right. and the, the thing is, and we'll get a little anthropological for a second. Please, please. Uh, so the, almost everyone, if you're not sociopathic, you will at least have love for those around you, those in your family and your close circles right. of friends. Even right. people who do awful things tend to love their family. Uh, it's like... Game of Thrones reference, Cersei Lannister, the thing Tyrion always says is, your one yeah. giving quality is you love your children. Right. Because <laughs> um, that's just kind of the bare minimum, right? Right. Um, and that's how we evolved, too, is, you know, we evolved in small, close-knit tribes, and you're supposed to care about those around you because you're all part of a social structure that keeps each other alive. And But when we're not... Are we not wired to really care about people we don't know? And, right. And I think that's one of the biggest problems that humanity has now that we've evolved into a global species is that it's much harder to have empathy for someone we don't know. And it's also, it's, it's practical that way too, because imagine how insane you would go if you grieved for every single person who died in the world. Right. Like you'd, yeah. go insa you'd go insane. On, on some level, when you hear about a death on the other side of the world, you kind of just have to go... Oh, well, like, that's a shame, but yeah, you don't, you don't, you don't I... really care. And so the thing is when 
these people in power, these politicians who are making life and death decisions and, you know, it, it's, give me a second to formulate this. Yeah, no, please take your time. So I think, yeah, so while most of us can care about our families, it takes an extra layer of morality to try your best to care, to go against your nature and to try and care about others you don't know. And we should all strive for that, right? Right. And, and on some level, we all, not, not all of us, but a, a lot of us do try to strive to care about others we don't know. Right. And, uh, but if those in power have completely thrown that out the window, you know, they, they've kind of, they, they just don't care about others and they're willing to enact policies that uh, are bad for other people. But if they still love their families and the people around them and they show that love on camera to the media and then right. that gets, and they, that gets broadcast out to everyone, then it creates the illusion that they are just like us, like the Royal family. Or, right. or you know, it, it gives that illusion that, Oh, they love their family. They must be good people. But behind closed doors, they have completely written off the people they control that they don't know, and they're willing to do awful things. Well, speaking speaking of awful things, I wanted to ask you about the Princess Diana uh, murder in addition, well, alleged murder, and uh, in addition to what happened with Harvey Weinstein and the ties with um, with with Epstein. You had mentioned earlier to me that you you found uh, parallels. Uh, and direct connections to the Epstein web or story, if you will. Um, is there anything you can, you can touch on with that? I, I'd be very interested. Yeah. And I think my audience, our audience would too. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We could talk about princess Diana first and then move on to Weinstein. Of um, uh, whatever, whatever order you like, brother. Yeah. So with Diana, so, so I'll say this when everything with Epstein started breaking, that's what really made me reevaluate my personal relationship with the term conspiracy theory. Right. Um, before that, I really didn't give conspiracies the time of day. In fact, I remembered, I remember a few years ago, uh, this probably 2016, 2017, I came across this video on Facebook, uh, with spooky music talking about pedophile Island and it was, huh. it was, it was Epstein shit. Uh, but wow. like, but, but I thought I, in, I just kind of rolled my eyes and kept scrolling. I was like, pedophile Island, that's not a thing. Well, it, and like. It, exactly to think that you know there's this island with this if, mm -hmm. you, if you had said this three four years ago people would have said what movie are you watching right exactly exactly so when it, it all started coming out it definitely like it kind of broke my brain a little bit i did have to reevaluate things and uh i just kind of decided to start looking into diana because i was like huh if the epstein stuff is real let me look into another conspiracy and see right. see what i think uh and there were definitely dodgy things about uh diana's death uh, i'm not gonna say with 100% certainty that it was a murder or anything, because we just don't know. But there are some dodgy things about it, and some of them do mirror things in the Epstein conspiracy that everyone finds dodgy. So, uh, for instance, so she, uh, her death happened in a tunnel in Paris, and there were 14 cameras in that tunnel, and right. not a single one of them captured the crash. Uh, they, right. were, they were all either oriented in a different direction or... The ones that were oriented in the right direction, they were all not working. Not working. That's that's but already ju that's just like what happened with Epstein. The oh the cameras weren't working. Like, sorry. Oh that's that's number one. You gotta I mean, any intelligence operation, take out the visual aspect of things. Mm -hmm. As long as people can't exactly. see, that's you know, that's 40, 50 percent of the battle right there. Mm -hmm. And then uh uh there were witnesses that saw like a white Fiat Uno uh, leaving the scene of the crash. And it was like a car of interest uh, in the uh, preceding um, investigations. Hmm. And uh, there was a French photographer, paparazzi, uh, who was uh, yeah, a person of interest in, in the whole thing. And, and he owned a white Fiat Uno. And he was found a few years later in a car that had been like uh scorched on fire and his charred remains were found in a, a car and he had a hole in his head Oof. Uh, and it was ruled a suicide 
uh, that's 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 cover up 101 in my mm-hmm. opinion. But sorry, and before uh, before you go on, sorry, uh, Camden brother, do you want to jump in or? Well, yeah, I was gonna say. Um, I mean, Ed, you were saying that you're like 100 percent certain can't say anything about Diana's death. I would mm-hmm. say like at worst, best, whichever one you want to say. Like they set up enough circumstantial things to kind of make something bad happen like the Mm -hmm. her driver definitely was had an alcoholic problem he was drunk when he got there like uh, like they set up the paparazzi like they set up enough to make sure something bad happened Mm -hmm. in at best whether or not it was a direct like set up conspiracy to kill her you know what i mean that's just that's just my own personal like input there on that well well also speaking of the driver and the drunkness uh in the toxicology report, I couldn't tell you the exact uh, blood alcohol content they said he had, but it was a ridiculous amount. And then, right, yeah. excuse me, um, there's footage of him just before they left the hotel to get in the car. And he looks sober as, sober as, he, he looks fine. Like he bent over yeah. to tie his, tie his shoe. Uh, if, if I forget the amount of blood alcohol content in his system, but it it was a ridiculous amount, enough that you wouldn't be able to like, be so nimble and bend over and tie your shoe and like spring back up. So that was always a bit weird too. Uh, I'll just say this real quick, circling back to the guy found in the car with a hole in his head. They, uh, they tried to claim that the hole was caused from the intense heat of the flames. Oh, come on. What? I, I mean, yeah, I, just doesn't uh, make sense. Yeah. it doesn't make sense to me. Um, yeah. And then Here's another in, thing about that. In the, is sorry, that he, in the in the perfectly shaped, you know, uh, geometric position of a bullet, you know, the, totally total fluke, right? But right, <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah, I, 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 I couldn't tell you specifically what the shape was and if it matched a bullet, but yeah, something to look into. Again, like uh, once I decide to make a video on this, I'm going to research it a lot more in depth so that I can be more more, uh, more certain about everything. But uh, yeah, and um, another thing about that is that. Diana predicted it uh, in her diary. She wrote that she thought her husband was going to kill her and stage it to look like a car accident. So, huh. yeah, that's that's I, but, I didn't know that. I honestly yeah. didn't know that. Mm-hmm. Um, Camden, do you want to jump in, brother? Yeah, no, I was just going to say, I mean, we're talking about these like really circumstantial suicides. So you've got I mean, the last year alone, maybe two years, you've had things like Kobe Bryant, you had Tiger Woods get in his car wrecks. Like so many of these car wrecks uh, sometimes just don't make sense. Right. How, mm-hmm. how, like, how deep do you think like these, these setups, even if it's all circumstantial to make something happen, like I just said, how deep do you think that really goes? Yeah. So I know a lot of like critics of the Diana conspiracy think it sounds way too elaborate to kill someone via car crash. Uh, like that, you know, they're like, oh, why not just poison her or something like more straightforward? But it was also revealed that MI6, uh, this is confirmed that MI6, uh, in the early 90s, just a few years before Diana's death, they had a plan written up to assassinate a leader of the Balkans, uh, using a car accident and using a strobe light to blind him in a tunnel. And, and there are witnesses from the Diana accident that said they saw a strobe light uh, with a blinding right, effect. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, th- yeah, this plan, they never used it. It was meant to be a, con- a contingency plan for if this Balkan leader ever did come into power. Uh, and they never used it. But uh, one of the guys that played a part in writing it up, he has come forward since then and said Diana's death just sounded eerily similar to the exact strategy <laughs> that they were writing up. That's that I honestly I didn't know that MI6 had that planned out. I mean, I the only thing I had read was speculation that you know, a, a, an anonymous source, which could be very good or sometimes totally unreliable, has said that MI6 loyalties have always been and always will be with the royal family, right? So if they want something done, it'll it'll get done if they really wanted it to. Definitely, yeah. And the, and the motives were all there too, like it, 
And if if it was an accident, it was a very convenient accident for the royal family. I mean, it seems interesting because if I'm not mistaken as well, I think there's um, a record number of car crashes that happen under that bridge, um, even mm. even up until recently. So, I mean, it would make sense. Where would you, if you want to stage a car crash, where would you do it? it you would probably want to do it in a place where, statistically speaking, car crashes happen so goddamn often that right. you can just brush it off as like, well, look, this is just one amongst many others, right? Yeah, definitely, yeah. Uh, Camden, do you want to jump in? Yeah, I was just going to say uh, you started to bring up the motives of that murder. It was speculative murder. Um, <laughs> had, what did, honestly, even the ro- just the royal family even, but what did the entire you know, narrative, the, the, the way they wanted to move the country, what did Britain gain from taking Diana out? What, why, why would they have made it like, you know, public figures that, to such actual fame like she was really honestly a celebrity more than anything oh. yeah so i, I believe so, she was the most famous woman in the world at that point. I, absolutely that's what i'm mm. saying so like what what did they what made it worth that risk of taking out the most famous woman in the world to take out the most famous woman in the world mm-hmm. so part of it was the fact that she was the most famous woman in the world she was uh stealing clout from them essentially uh, uh yeah okay um so she married into the royal family she was married to charles and then charles was having an affair with camilla his current wife and um so i just find it so funny that i know this much about the royal family now because i didn't used to know shit before i got too more conspiratorial <laughs> i used right. to like i'd be like who the fuck cares about the royal family yeah but <laughs> but now look at me all gossipy charles was having an affair with camilla and, yeah. uh, <laughs> like, and, and apparently diana was pregnant with uh, pr- pr- Harry at that point. No, 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 uh, no, no. No, with a, a prince's. Uh, she had a prince's baby. Yeah, uh, he, he wasn't a he wasn't a prince. He was an elite. He was a Middle Eastern elite. Sorry, his, my uh, fault. yeah. Uh, his, I forget what his dad's line of work was, but his dad was a very very rich man, and so he was. And yes, yeah, she was dating the son of a very rich Middle Eastern man, and that was another potential motive is that they didn't want Diana having a brown baby because the royal family is notoriously racist. Yeah. Um, and this was also, you know, 30 years ago when they were probably even more racist than they are now. Um, right. But um, where was I going? Uh, so I was, I was going to, th- there's so many motives that they would have had. I had one on the tip of my tongue. What was it going to be? So there was, the, like there, was, there was the potential baby. Oh, and I'll say this real quick. Uh, she was also embalmed, like, they went against protocol and embalmed her way too quickly, apparently. Uh, huh. they, they embalmed her right after. And uh, some people speculate that that was done to obscure the fact that she was pregnant. I see. Okay. Yeah. So they couldn't do that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. That, that, that makes sense. So that they couldn't do the autopsy or anything like that. Mm-hmm. Right. And then, and this is all speculation, but this is, this is a way it could potentially tie into Epstein level stuff is that are you guys aware of jimmy savile yep yep so uh, uh, sorry could you explain very briefly just for our audience for those who are not uh, familiar with jimmy savile who right is? right so jimmy savile was a he started out as a working class dj in northern england and he, he he rose to fame and he ended up having connections with royalty uh, margaret thatcher uh, who was the prime minister at the time, he ended up getting all these, uh, he just rose to fame and started getting all these elite connections, almost in a spacey esque way. Um, and it was to the point where he ended up being a marriage counselor for Diana and Charles at one point, even though he had no credentials to be one. He was, huh. just, a, he was just a DJ. And then he ended up getting, I think he had a show in the 70s called Jim Will Fix It. Uh, and he was almost like a... Uh, I feel like he was, he was almost like a Willy Wonka-esque kind of eccentric kind of figure. Uh, I think a good like American analogy too would be kind of uh, he was almost as beloved in a similar way to like Bill Cosby, kind of like a jester and like okay, lovable, so not, so kind of not seen ne- wholesome. Sorry, so not necessarily a Gatsby figure per se, not as no. not necessarily mysterious. Yeah, no, not really mysterious. Just kind of a whimsical guy. Uh, right, right. Uh, and. Um, yeah, he ended up with all these connections to, uh, you know, the powers that be in the UK. He was Charles and Diana's marriage counselor. And after his death, 
Uh, his death, I think, was around 2008, 2009. All these horrible allegations and charges came out against him where he was essentially, like, not just a pedophile and a rapist, but even, like, a necrophiliac and all this, like, awful, awful, all these awful th stories started coming out. Uh, he would do... Sorry, necro necrophiliac? What's that again? Dead having, sex, having sex with dead people. So oh, shit. on your description, I would say he sounds a lot like Bill Cosby, actually. Yeah, right. No, exactly. Uh, worse than Cosby, but yeah, not, yeah. Um, and uh, sorry, one second. So yeah, so he was the marriage counselor for Charles and Diana, and oh, I know, I wanted to go with this. Um, the way he got access to dead bodies was he was he was basically he would run a lot of charities and stuff as these elite elite pedophiles tend to do uh right. uh and he would yeah he would he had access to all these hospitals that he was like uh, had charitable connections to and that's how he would get access to victims live and dead he was abusing people at these hospitals living Jesus patients Christ. and then also raiding the morgues to that's fuck the fucked. dead bodies that's fucked yeah and that's uh and I wish I had the name of the hospital written down, but there was a specific hospital that he had access to through his charities. And uh, Diana also did work there. Oh my and, gosh. So this, yeah. Okay. Yeah, and it, So this is all speculation, but Diana, again, like most famous woman in the world and kind of a beacon of all that was good in the world. I'm not, right. not, trying, to, not trying to deify her. Uh, no, no, but, no, no. But, but she was deified in, by the public. Uh, a symbol of hope and all that is good if if you're going and if someone is at this hospital some disenfranchised sick person who's getting abused if there's one person they could tell it would be this woman who has power and who is clearly a, a good person right and like someone who not only you you're confident can help you but will help you would help you it wouldn't surprise me if well, that hospital yeah. was used for many different things, like in terms of mm -hmm. transferring, whether it was, again, unfortunate to say, but, you know, live children, people or dead, uh, either or. It sounds like it was uh, it, it sounds like it would be a, a good literal and metaphorical opening for, I guess, a, a vast network of, again, doing depraved things. Right. But uh, yeah. sorry, uh, uh, Camden, brother, you want to jump in? Well, I was just going to. Uh had the question before we got off the royal family but you said you only recently you know started to get into the royal family a couple of years ago and like it's weird how much you know and like can talk about them and things so mm -hmm. of course not ascribing to it myself but there's a large sorry my dog there's a large population of the internet that likes to play around with the idea of queen elizabeth queen elizabeth being a reptile lady um yeah uh or donald marshall uh had that letter where like she would like play with him every night and he was in a cloning center things and like crazy queen elizabeth things i just you know what's your kind of yeah. uh, weirdest conspiratorial take on her yeah definitely not i definitely don't take it as far as uh, reptilian alien or whatever i definitely don't take it that far but right 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 uh and she has she's really popular in the uk and she's 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 maintained her popularity throughout her reign sorry brother uh, are you are you based out of the uk so i i was born in the uk okay, uh okay. i i live in i live in the states and i've lived in the states most of my life gotcha okay yeah cool i did i didn't want you to you know be committing treason but uh, right <laughs> yeah yeah um so she has maintained her popularity uh in my in my video on abc uh quashing the epstein story i found a couple abc clips and they were talking about queen elizabeth and how she's always understood the power of the media uh i mean she came to power in the 50s like the television was just coming around and she literally and, rose with the media kind of thing absolutely. yeah yeah so i think she's always been someone who understands the media and how to how she wants to be portrayed in the media and i think that plays a big role in her popularity to this day um and to be honest i don't know if she she, she could be not a monster like she could be like she's not necessarily a sex deviant but her son definitely is and she's protecting him so right. 
you know, at the end of the day, she's protecting her pedophile son. It's certainly, yeah, no, no, no. it's definitely something that, that shouldn't be overlooked by, by any means. Um, mm -hmm. I wanted to, to jump to your, um, anthropological perspective with regards to like, you know, the technological revolution and uh, cultural social revolution of everything that's going on politically, technologically and all that. Um, I know that's quite a broad topic to cover, but I know that it is your area of expertise. So uh, I, again, by all means, start wherever you like. Um, is there anything, did you, if you want me to start with a question, it would be, you know, just because of what's going on in uh, the real world right now, uh, from an anthropological perspective, I think our audience would want to hear this too. What are your thoughts personally, in addition to being able to mix in your education as to whether or not the likelihood of uh, uh, some type of extraterrestrial presence is here on this planet? I know that aliens is not your area of expertise, but anthropology kind of, you know, conflates into that. So what what would your perspective on that be so am i and okay then, to, and then sorry uh, if, it, if it's cool with you i'd like to jump into emergence afterwards but sorry yeah definitely yeah um if can we come back to the aliens thing and i can just kind of give a broad uh sure. yeah hit. uh i got some notes written down uh and i think a good way to get into this side of things i could just describe what the name stewards of revolution means like where that by, came from. by all means by all means so yeah. just very quickly everyone uh, the audience when you're listening you're watching this uh, jameson's channel is called stewards of revolution just as a reminder to everybody yeah so so i borrow that from a paper i wrote a couple of years ago and the paper was on the relationship between technological revolution and social cultural revolution gotcha uh because obviously whenever there's a technological revolution it can drastically change uh, our culture and our society and re the way we organize ourselves right uh, and this goes all the way back to the agricultural revolution so for most of human history or, or yeah for most of human existence and prehistory uh we existed as hunter gatherers and existed in you know tribes of a couple hundred people tops and it was very egalitarian uh that was right. not uh you know when they killed a mammoth everyone would get a cut of the meat everyone would eat uh right. if they had tools they were generally community owned and everyone would grab a spear to go out and hunt with and then put it back in the stockpile generally speaking and um obviously any tr any one tribe any one culture can have its own uh methods of surviving and subsisting right um and yeah they're very egalitarian and yes there's probably some level of power differential there there was obviously they'd have leaders and shamans who had you know some social power but at the end of the day not nearly on the level that you see today with like wealth inequality and things like that uh but then the agricultural revolution happened and that stopped us from being nomadic uh and people started to settle in one place and developing agriculture and starting being able to stockpile in silos and and the such and once you can start stockpiling resources, that's when power differentials start emerging. Because when you're a hunter gatherer, you know you you get a kill, you eat it, you move on. You get another kill, you eat it, you move on. Like you, you're not right. really you're you're not really accumulating resources. You're you're making enough to subsist on like throughout your life. But now that once with the agricultural revolution, with people staying in one place and with now uh, food that can be stockpiled, resources in general can be stockpiled. That's when power differentials really started emerging. And then, so for most of human history, uh, we existed in, uh, the economy was either slave or peasant based, uh, right? Uh, right. And it wasn't until the industrial revolution that that changed, another revolution that changed everything after the agricultural revolution and when the industrial revolution happened we went from slave and peasant based economies to a system where uh, basically a capitalist system where the work the peasants went from the farms to the factories but they needed to be they need to have at least a small amount of economic power or economic ability just so that they can buy the products that they're making it was in the interest of the owners of the factories that right. the that the people that worked at the factories could uh buy some of the products that they were making 
And so I think in our history, the agricultural revolution and the industrial revolution are the two biggest technological revolutions that have changed the way we organized and changed what it means to be human or to, to be a part of humanity. And what worries me is that after each one of these two revolutions, we had centuries of time, millennia in the case of the agricultural revolution, to we had all this time to kind of recalibrate to this drastic change. But technological growth is exponential. And now we're getting to the point where we're going to be getting revolution after revolution after revolution just kind of hitting us. You know, right. uh, the, the internet revolution was huge. Uh, artificial intelligence and automation, that's coming. Genetic engineering is coming up. And like each one of these things is going to change humanity drastically. And I mean, the internet revolution, that's already, you know, we're already well into that now. And there are some worrying aspects about that. We haven't really adapted to it well, well in many the, ways. The, sorry, to, I don't mean to interrupt you. The, the question it becomes, uh, you know, the, the technology is moving faster than the culture and the society. Exactly, exactly. Right. Yeah, because culture, so, culture yeah. is always able to adapt at a pretty constant rate. And right. when that rate was above the rate of technological growth, everything was all right. But now that technological growth is yeah so exponential, it's, it's, it's really tough for culture to keep up. Uh, we really saw this pretty starkly in like 2015, 2016, uh, in just the way social media has uh, made politics so toxic. Uh, and y y people are getting very personal. I mean, I find, uh, for example, um, I'll bring this up very, very quickly. I find that you look at certain politics of other countries around the world. There is that political infighting, yes, but it's not like the attacks don't get personal because it's for the betterment of the country. And I think one example I could give, I know this is debatable, but, you know, Israel, you look at Israeli politics, it's, you know, uh, the opposition leader wins and takes, you know, the, the seat of the prime minister uh, and their cabinet and administration moves in. The outgoing one doesn't take jabs, doesn't do anything like that because it's for the betterment of the people. And arguably, a lot of people would say, you know, it, it took the Holocaust for them uh, to, to realize this and congregate together and say, we can't let an external force cause this again. And it's unfortunate that that had to be, um, I don't want to say a wake up call for them, because I'm, you know, I'm not too delved into Israeli history. But I think the overall example would be a good one compared to Western politics, where it's just, you know, attack, 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 right? Yeah. And when you bring up like personability, that one of the problems is if you're conducting yourself politically online, you're talking about emotionally charged subjects that people care a lot about. Right. But, if, but you're talking with people you don't know. And again, we were just talking earlier about how it's harder to have empathy for someone you don't know. Right. Espe especially if they're saying something that is at direct odds with one of your beliefs. And it gets so toxic and it just create, makes the divide even more extreme. And if you think about like the two probably the two most political social media platforms are they're arguably Facebook and Twitter. Right. Yeah. And think, think about Facebook. When someone writes something, how do you label, how do you label someone else's comment? You label it with an angry face or a laughing face, which is condescending. Uh, right. a, a like that you, you label it with your own emotional reaction to it. Right. You're not, you're not, you're not, you're not labeling the content itself. You're, you're, you're just giving your emotional reaction to it, which just doesn't seem like a very smart way to conduct ourselves politically. Is that like, even really labeling per se? That's more, like you said, a reaction than a yeah. label. Well, yeah, yeah, exactly. And so I think it would be a much better system if we labeled each other's comments with, uh, I think we should have a plethora of different uh, labels to give, such as like hypocritical or I like that. eloquent, I like that. Like, things like that. Like, and that, that, this kind of ties into when we're talking about adapting culture to technological revolutions, we should be, we should be shaping our technology in a way that it is going to be uh, advantageous. Like instead of just reacting to the way it shapes us, because that's kind of what we're doing right now. Right. Reacting to the way it shapes uh, instead of vice versa. Yeah. Right. 